I suppose I should start asking, when was the last time you saw Closely Watched Trains, and what was your experience watching it tonight? About 1966. It, it, it wow. was interesting to see what I remembered mm -hmm. and what I didn't. And uh, what a nice movie. I want to sort of start by setting the stage, the context in which this film was made. And in an interview that I read, uh, you referred to the Czech New Wave and the sort of the work that Czech artists in general were doing during that cultural and political moment of the mid-1960s in Czechoslovakia as, quote, a conspiracy against stupidity. <laughs> Can you describe what it was like being a part of that conspiracy and what that moment felt like when you were living it? It was quite exciting. We, we, we were very young, and uh, uh, we hated the official movie production. Mm -hmm. The studio was producing about 36 <coughs> movies a year, and it was based on the aesthetics of the Russian ideologue Zhdanov, and it was uh, supposed to be social, realistic movies, mm -hmm. and uh, which, which was totally ridiculous, like a, a, a regular uh, worker from the factory <coughs> lived in an apartment which nobody could afford, <laughs> stuff like that. <coughs> but anyway, we... Uh, we are very lucky because we, I personally believe that to, to make a good movie, not only then, mm -hmm. but here too, uh, many, many things you cannot control have to come together, mm -hmm. and including weather, for example. And uh, we were just lucky that uh, when we started our classes in the film academy uh, that the communist regime was slowly melting. And uh, so w we also uh, had a very good education mm -hmm. because, uh, as I told you, the, mm -hmm. the dean of the school was a real academician and he was like in his 60s and he was teaching <coughs> a movie history and he started his classes every year. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to show you movies you are not supposed to see. <laughs> and uh, and if it gets out of this class, I'm going to deny it. That was his opening, and uh, and he did. He showed us Bergman and he showed us American movies. Uh, I remember Mr. Smith going to Washington, and uh, and uh, but you know the communist censorship was so stupid that they, for example, we are not supposed to see the film of De Sica mm -hmm. called Miracolo a Milano, which was written by Zavattini, who was a, a member of Communist Party. I met him later on. And, uh, uh, and why? It was, it, the film was about homeless. I don't know if you saw it. It's one of my favorite films. Mm -hmm. And it, it, there is a uh, camp of homeless people and, and that's what the film, and finally they try to chase them out because they find oil <coughs> there. And it's a kind of a fairy tale mm -hmm. and it ends up with the police buses taking all these homeless people into jail 
And uh, when they go through a main square in Milan, mm -hmm. uh, because it's a fairy tale, uh, one of the characters is holding a dove and, and uh, wishing something, and the buses stop and they open up. And uh, there are sweepers who are cleaning up the with the long brooms and they take these brooms and fly away mm -hmm. and as the voiceover says where buongiorno is always buongiorno mm -hmm. <laughs> and the film was banned in Czechoslovakia you know why because he knows the geography of Milan knows that they are flying toward the west It was so stupid, and we had to deal with it practically every day. So uh, it was exciting to make movies which uh, we felt were subversive. And, uh, and to tell you the truth, I miss it a little bit. Uh, to make a movie which can put you in jail, it's exciting. It's the time for subversive movies again, I think. But, um, <laughs> you know, I was going to ask you, um, Closely Watched Trains was co-written um, and based on the story by um, the Czech author, uh, Bohumil Hrabel. Your first short film, A Boring Afternoon, was adapted for one of his stories, and he starred in that film. Menzel is known for adapting a number of Hrabel's works, um, and we're going to see many of them throughout this series. But... What was the f what was the connection between his writing, his novels, and your vision as a filmmaker, or, Men or the New Wave's vision as as, as artists, Menzel in particular? And was he a was he a, a welcoming collaborator? Was he someone that was it was easy to work with? Uh, Mr. Rabal was a extraordinary person. He uh, he worked on the this is. Uh, uh, Partly his biography. During the war, he worked on a, a, a train station, and uh, and after the war, the communists didn't like him. They wouldn't let him publish, and he was working as a garbage man. And we got together once, and we said, "What can we do for him?" And uh, we decided to make movies based on his short stories, mm -hmm. which were called The Perils on the Bottom. Right. And uh, for some reason, uh, <coughs> which I don't remember too much, I made the first one. Mm -hmm. And they, <laughs> they send it to a festival, you know, and they treated us, the film studio, <laughs> like, uh, like second class citizens. They sent my movie to the film festival in Mannheim in Germany, but they never told me that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had my radio always tuned to Deutsche Welle mm -hmm. because one of my friends defected Czechoslovakia and was one of the anchors there. So I would listen to his voice. And so I came home, I turn on the radio, and I hear his voice saying, and the first film on the Money Apple Festival got a film by Ivan Passer, Boring Afternoon. <laughs> and uh, I will never forget it. It was such a shock to me, because I didn't know it was there. And uh, it, it was also the way they treated Mr. Rabal, you know. He was a garbage man. And uh, But after this uh, short, they won some prizes in festivals and all. So he became more legitimate. Mm -hmm. And then he wrote this novel. And uh, <coughs> he had an office in a beer house. He liked beer. <laughs> and uh, I had a picture when President Clinton went visit Prague, so the Czech president, Václav Havel, took him to visit Mr. Rabal 
and they went to this <coughs> beer house. I had a beer <laughs> with Mr. Rabba. And he, uh, you know, was like on the level of like Milan Kundera, mm -hmm. only a totally different style. Yeah. And uh, uh, he was a wonderful storyteller. He, uh, he never complained about the communists. Mm -hmm. He took it as weather, you know, as something you have to deal with. And uh, and uh, then when uh, Menzel made this movie, and to everybody's surprise, he got an Academy Award. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, he he was uh, very very pleased. Did um oh, did Menzel ever speak to you about his collaboration with Rommel and how they how they work together in terms of adaptation? Uh, no, he, he gave me, as I told you, mm -hmm. he gave me the script to read before he made the movie. And I remember that, you know, I liked the script and all that. And, and when we had a discussion, I expressed a certain uh, uh, opinion that made, because Menzel, who was a very good actor, by the way, mm -hmm. You see him in this movie, he's playing the doctor who is telling the main guy, you know, you have to think about soccer, yes? Mm -hmm. That's Menzel, that's the director. And uh, uh, he wanted to play uh, th the main character. And I said to him, uh, you know, maybe you should consider to have somebody younger, somebody who has some kind of innocence about. And uh, I don't remember what he answered, <laughs> but he eventually did it. And I don't even know because of me, but, uh, but I remember we had this discussion. Uh, and, uh, you know, Mr. Rabal was, he was very respectful uh, for other people's work. So when I wrote a script based on this short story, mm -hmm. and when I gave him a little part in, in that, and uh, he approved everything. I mean, he, uh, he, he understood that the, the director has a vision mm -hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> that, uh, the vision either turns out to be correct or mm -hmm. or effective or or not. It was interesting when you told me the story about um, you telling Menzel not to cast himself as um, the, the the station master because I had recently read through the um, Joseph Skorecki Skorecki wrote a memoir of the New Wave um, called um, All the All the um, I think it's All the Pretty and Smart. Men and women, I was yeah, in yeah, my notes yeah. here. Yeah. But he, he he wrote in the in the memoir. He wrote, "quote I am convinced that the reason Giri Menzel did such a superb job with Rabel's closely watched trains lies in the fact that he himself is essentially Milos Roma." And in that context, I thought it was interesting that he cast himself as the doctor because then he ends up kind of advising this character, who I guess um, at least this critic felt was very much like Menzel, but. One of the things, and we were talking about this earlier, that makes the new wave, the Czech new wave, so interesting and fascinating is how different so all of the films are in terms of, there's such a range of styles and approaches from Vera Chitlova's sort of surrealist work to Menzel's sort of light comedies and, you know, f Foreman's, you know, satires. But you attributed that to the different kinds of personalities that everybody had. You all had such very different person. Could you talk a little bit about how you think Menzel's personality related to his filmmaking? Is there a connection there? Uh, you know, uh, in my view, Menzel was probably the most talented of us all. Because uh, not only that he made movies, but he was acting on the stage and in the films. And 
he directed theater also, uh, which none of us did. And, and he was always very busy. And what, what was interesting about him that he was kind of the most mysterious character. I mean, we never knew if he had a girlfriend or not. <laughs> and uh, he, he was always very uh, uh, kind of mysterious about his politics. Mm -hmm. You know, he never expressed uh, openly what he thought, although we assumed that he was on the right side of his story. Right, right. Uh, that, uh, which of course he was, but uh, he was, I don't know if it was because he was cautious uh, or it was, it was probably his personality because even about his personal life, he was mysterious. But there was a there was um, I mean in terms of like the the connection between all all of you who made up the new wave. I mean a lot of collaboration, a lot of support, a lot of connection. What? How did you and how did the community of filmmakers um, in the new wave respond when Closely Watched Trains won the Academy Award? I mean, I checked on earlier won Academy Award just a few years before, but yeah. Uh, y you know what was unique about that period was that because we came from the same school where we had classes together and <coughs> sometimes different classes <coughs> but uh, and we participated in discussions about films these gentlemen the, the dean of the school was showing us and uh, and what was absolutely unique, I never saw anywhere else, and I lectured in many different film schools in different countries. Mm -hmm. We understood that the success of one of us is an opportunity for the other. So we were competitive. We would, uh, you know, we would criticize each other, uh, usually with humor. Mm -hmm. uh, but we wished each other a success for that because we understood that it opens the door for everybody, mm -hmm. which I think is unique. I have never seen it anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and. And strangely enough, it it finished with the Russian invasion, and you know, once in a while, I go back and I meet my friends who make movies. And it doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a, a kind of a silly competitive atmosphere. <laughs> Uh, which doesn't lead to anything good. Mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, we, uh, when I worked with Miloš Forman, uh, we were three always, uh, Jaroslav Pavlušek, myself, and Miloš. And people ask Miloš, why do you always write in threesome? And Miloš says, so one of us can take a nap. That was, <laughs> that was his <laughs> answer. And uh, we learned that it's extremely effective because that threesome acts as a filter. If somebody comes up with a bad idea, those other two say, no, no that's no good and all that. And, uh, and when I teach, I like to tell my students, statistically, the people who work in two sums or three sums, even more, are more successful than when they work by themselves. Mm -hmm. So I take them to people who work like that, mm -hmm. so they can see the result. Uh, because we stumbled over that uh, recognition. Right. 
uh, because I went to a boarding school with Miloš and we knew each other since we were 10 years old and and uh, and one day <laughs> Uh, I was still at school, and Miloš finished already. Uh, and we were talking, how in this bloody country you can make a good movie? So <laughs> Miloš took an <coughs> empty piece of paper, and we wrote down several points. And I don't remember all of them, but I remember that we we will work with non-actors because we felt all the actors were, you know, I mean, they went through all these social realistic movies and they were tainted, tainted by that. And uh, although in the studio they said to us, uh, listen guys, I, we know you like neorealistic movies, but, uh, you know, Italians, they talk with their hands and they are very animated, but Czechs are melancholic. It will not work in front of camera, they used to tell us. And, uh, of course, it was nonsense. And, uh, uh, like, for example, the mother of this girl in Mensa's film who got all these stamps, I found her in a tramway, in a... I was with uh, Yara Pavoshek, mm -hmm. the other guy who rode with Miloš, and we were riding, I don't know where we were going, but we saw her sitting there, and we just looked at each other, and we waited when she left, and she stepped out of the tramway, and we started to talk to her, and, and then, then she was in Miloš's film, Lazo the Blonde, and she became a star. I mean, she was in movies like Mansell took her, and she had this natural talent, this woman. And, uh, and that was very exciting to cast movies uh, with people who had no experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and somehow we got lucky. Uh, we would do auditions. And, uh, you know, I if I may, I go a little bit off the subject. We would audition everybody before we gave them a part, yeah? But if somebody wants to be a president of the United States, he doesn't audition. I think there should be an amendment that anybody who wants to uh, run for the president has to have two years of public service. So you get to know those people. Reality TV shows don't count as a <laughs> <laughs> regard. <laughs> we have uh, some time for a question from the audience. If anyone has a question, just go ahead and raise your hand. I'll call you. Okay, we're going to bring a mic over to you and we'll ask your question. Uh, the term Czech New Wave, was. did you always call yourselves that, or was there a certain point where you, it felt like people started calling you that, or when did it feel like that phrase took hold yeah. and you were the Czech New Wave? We have absolutely no idea. <laughs> uh, there was a French New Wave at that time, and we, we liked the French movies very well. But this was foreign critics who started to call that period Czech New Wave. Uh, and it fits somehow because, but we had no idea when we were in the middle of it. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Okay. Oh, um, over here. We're going to bring a mic back up to you, okay? Uh, I wanted to see. Uh, Cutter's Way is one of my favorite films. Such a great movie. And uh, when you did you want to come to America? And when you came to America, how were you were you accepted by the other filmmakers? Uh, thank you for liking liking Cutter's Way. Uh, 
I like it too, I must say. It's <laughs> fantastic. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. It's really amazing. Uh, you know, as I was saying, that you need many uh, factors to come together to make a good movie. And uh, just an example, uh, when the producer asked me to do it, he wanted Richard Dreyfus to play the lead. And I read the script and I said, yes, I, I would do that because the characters were familiar mm -hmm. to me, people who came from prisons, you know, war, Second World War and all that. So I, I, I knew those characters. But I said, I don't want Richard Dreyfus. And, and United Artists said, but that's why we are making the movie. Because as you know, uh, most of the movies are made with stars. And I said, go ahead and make it, but I'm not making it. He's not right for the part. Anyway, <laughs> then they said, we are making the biggest hit of all times, Heaven's Gate. If you get, <laughs> we would like to have a follow-up movie, follow-up uh, movie with one of the stars, which is Jeff Bridges. Mm -hmm. So we sent him, a, and, and they said, but we are not going to help you to get it. You have to. So we sent him a script here, they're like a falling apart, like a ranch style house in Malibu. And, and we drove to his house, and the producer, it was his first movie, and he was like an overgrown hippie, he had a, 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 a hair down to <laughs> his bottom, and, and he was shaking because he was like two years already trying to put it together. And we rang the bell, and uh, uh, Jeff came and opened the door. It made a Hitchcocky and sound like, Aah. and I knew he wanted to do the film because he was in dungarees, bare breasted, uh, barefooted. But I didn't have time to tell the producer, and there were two German shepherds standing behind uh, Jeff, and so. You know, it's that awkward moment when you say hello, hello, and then what do you say next? And, and so the producer who was so nervous, he passed by Jeff Bridges and went to the second German shepherd who looked like a coyote. And he said, uh, and he, he was like six feet four, and he leaned over and he said, you are the nice doggy. What is your name, nice doggy? And the <laughs> doggy did woof and took off his cheek. You could see his teeth right here. So the first thing Jeff Bridges said was, oh my God. And <laughs> he ran into the house, came up with towels, and <laughs> put it on uh, this producer's face. And we drove him down to Malibu to a doctor. <laughs> and we were sitting in a uh, waiting room, and the nurses were coming in and out. And Jeff was saying, how is it going? And they say, it's OK, don't worry about it. We never mentioned the script. <laughs> and somebody asked, while we were making the movie, what you would have done if you didn't like the script? And Jeff said, I would have made the movie. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Uh, well, the other question was, and we have a few minutes, and it's, I think it's a, a, an interesting subject. The question of, did you want to leave Czechoslovakia and come to Los Angeles? Wh but what was that experience of yeah. exile-like? And of course, Menzel stayed. And I was wondering how that might have also affected right. the right. group. Uh, <coughs> I tell you how we, it's, it's, a, it's a nice short story, uh, Left as Milos. Because, you know, the Fireman's Ball, which was satire on a Politburo, which they realized only when it was in a movie theaters and some f communist functionaries complained about it. So they banned the movie. And then Alexander Dubček became the secretary of communist party and he released the movie. And uh, because it was already what they call Prague Spring. It was like a social democracy emerging. And uh, then the Russians came. And of course, they immediately banned the movie. And uh, we, we knew with Milo 
Bush that it's the future doesn't look too good for her. And uh, one day somebody called me at 10 o'clock at night that the Russian tanks are leaving <coughs> military barracks in a small town near Prague, coming to Prague. So I took my car and looked, sure enough, uh, that, that's what I saw. So I <coughs> called Miloš and told him what I saw. He said, pick me up in an hour, because we were afraid they will take away our passports. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so at 4 o'clock in the morning, we were on the uh, border between Czechoslovakia and Austria. And there were patches of snow and nobody there. The uh, officer came up with a Kalashnikov over his shoulder. And he said, comrades, where are you going? And I rolled down the window. I said, we are going for a weekend to Vienna. He said, can I see your passport? So I gave him the passport. And he g went through it and he said, where is your exit visa? Which was a yellow piece of paper, which nobody got, yes. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's not there, it must be in the back of the car. So I got out of the car, opened the back and pretending I'm looking for it. And I hear this kind of a dialogue. Officer says, are you Miloš Forman, the film director? And Miloš, who had a very deep voice, yeah, yes. And the officer said, you know, I have seen all your movies, the officer said. And Miloš said, and I thought I'm going to drop dead when I heard that. And Miloš said, and I bet you didn't like any of them. <laughs> Can you imagine in that situation at 4 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> and the, the officer said, are you kidding? Do you remember that scene from Las of Blonde? Like the ring is rolling on the floor under the table. And, and he, be, he began to describe scenes from Miloš's movies. Then he leaned like that. He said, don't look for the Uzebiza. <laughs> <laughs> I came back and he let us go. And he used in Czech uh, something you say only when you know you will never see the people again. He said, in Czech, be with God. And uh, that was it. And we thought we are living only for like a year because it was so absurd that the communist Soviet Union <laughs> invaded communist Czechoslovakia. Yeah. And uh, of course, we went to Paris and uh, because we knew François Truffaut and Claude Berry, uh, they took care of us for a week and then we went to New York. And uh, you ask me how I was, you know, I never met any filmmakers in New York. I was so lucky that I cannot even believe it. Imagine that about not even three months after I got there, uh, one Czech guy arranged a birthday party for his wife. Actually, he was in the reception, the same guy. And uh, so I went there, and there were like 30 Czechs having fun. And, and there was one guy leaning against the wall. Nobody talked to him. He was the only American who had a Czech girlfriend who wanted to be there. <coughs> and I felt I, I need to improve my English. So I spent the whole evening with him. And his, his name was David Milton, he's a writer. And he invited me to opening of his Off, Off, Off Broadway play, where I went that week. There were like three people in the audience and two of them left during <laughs> the intermission. <laughs> we went to get a beer, it, it was called Lion's Head. And uh, he said to me, you know, I'm doing this for 15 years. I cannot make a living. And I said, listen, did, did you write a script, a uh, film script? He said, no, I wouldn't know how. I said, you know, I wrote a few 
So if you want, to write a script. He said, what do we write about? I said, about the characters from your play. And we sat down, and in three months, we had a script. And he knew some theater owner, one of those small theaters in New York, who had some connection to United Artists. So he gave him the script, <coughs> and the guy gave it to United Artists. And they said, yeah, we have a deal with uh, uh, George Siegel. We, we are supposed to give him three projects a year, we don't have anything for him. So we give him this, and George Seeger said yes. And I was on a set shooting American movie <laughs> with 120 people of a crew. I felt such an anxiety, I was throwing up, and then my assistant was cleaning up <laughs> behind me. And uh, the film got an award of the film critics for the best uh, movie of a year, and it opened the door. I'm going to ask to take the last question. We only have a few more minutes, but did, have you ever spoken to Menzel about his decision to stay in Czechoslovakia? Is that a subject he talks about? Yeah, because he was here, I think, twice mm -hmm. visiting. And but you know, as I told you, he was a mysterious guy. We knew one thing about him: he was very much attached to his mother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and. Uh, I don't really remember what he told me, but but I'm sure that that I opened up that discussion. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe it was a language uh, issue that, uh, uh, but you know, My view, my view, and I'm <coughs> if his wife was here, Olinka, she would correct me if, if I'm wrong. But I always felt that he had it very easy in life, mm -hmm. Menzo, uh, compared to other people, like me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? uh, I was kicked out of the high school as an enemy of the people. I was, I ended up with gypsies. I was with, you know, I ended up in a steel mill and stuff like that. But Menzel, his wife was, his life was very smooth, you know, very, he was very comfortable. Mm -hmm. And that was probably the reason why he didn't want to leave. Mm -hmm. That's my view. Maybe a little bit like Milos in the film today. Sorry? Maybe a little bit like the, you know, the station master, Milos in the film today. His life was kind of, yes, he was yes. hoping his life would just be easy, yes. you know, with yes, it, like yes. his father as well. Yes. Um, I want to again make a pitch for the Sunday documentary in which Ivan Passer is interviewed several times um, that really goes deep into this period of time when the Czech New Wave emerged and what happened afterwards, after the, the Soviet invasion. But um, I also just want to say thank you so much for being here tonight. It's an honor really to have you on stage. So thank you, thank you. I appreciate it.